guys, if you guys have a box, so I can go ahead and get started. Um, so let's begin. I think other things you should go ahead. If you haven't turned in your time, wrap it up. Wrap it up. Um, go ahead and do that. Um, I'm just going to go ahead the game plan for today, you can look at the syllabus, which we haven't exactly been updated, but it was already updated. Um, the game plan for today will be just to review the drafting exercise, which kind of gives us thinking, brainstorming about how not so much to draft a complaint, but kind of assess a cause of action, um, analyze a set of facts with the thought in mind that maybe down the road you're going to have to draft a complaint, and indeed that's what you're going to have to do for next class. So we're going to um, review the drafting exercise as the syllabus notes, um, just talk a little bit more about complaints, but really kind of turn our attention pretty quickly to the next drafting exercise, which will be due by this Saturday at 5 o'clock, and that exercise is to review an assigned case file. It's substantially the same file that you read um, before. I've edited the Porsche Pons fact pattern a little bit, um, and what you're ultimately going to have to do is draft a complaint based on that fact pattern. Um, but to begin, I thought we would start, and then, then that will be drafting exercise for next class. Of course, the reading assignment will be new as well, um, and that will focus on answers, right, which is um, also known as defensive pleadings. And so we will, you will finish the drafting exercise by Saturday at 5 o'clock. That will be drafting the complaint, and then you'll turn your attention to the reading exercise on answers, um, which will be about 40 hours to do that. It's not too long, um, and we've already kind of introduced that concept a little bit um, as well. So let's, for, any questions about where we are, where we're going? It might be a lighter hour. I mean, like, I don't think we're going to go the whole time because I don't necessarily think we need to. Um, let's just see how long we go. I'm also kind of battling the cold, so I'm constantly kind of doing this and see if we're going to fly. Um, let's look at the drafting exercise that you did, drafting exercise um, number two. So this is the slip and fall premises liability. It's a complaint, but it's really um, nothing more than just a fact pattern. Um, and you'll recall the fact pattern says that your client is named Portia Bond and she runs a cleaning business known as Old Town Commercial Cleaning. On November 1st, 2019, Portia was injured while she was performing janitorial services at Grantham's Jewelry Store, which is owned by Philip Grantham. Your paralegal recently interviewed Portia and learned the following facts. And it sets out a number, um, kind of a paragraph just laying out some allegations um, with respect to this slip and fall on a five-gallon bucket, five bucket of jewelry cleaning solution. There were, in reading over it again, I noticed there were a few things that I think um, made it a little bit of an ambiguous kind of gray. People are applauding us there. You love Portia Bond. Um, it's a little bit of a gray fact pattern, and I try to clean up some of that. We'll talk about some of that ways I edited the uh, fact pattern um, at the end of class. But what do you all think? Let's go in order with some of these questions. I mean, there, some of these have a right wrong answer. Some of them don't. Um, but you'll see a task, right? There was a memorandum of the practical effect of Kentucky Rules of Civil Procedure. Rules on pleading practice, that kind of big takeaway there was a fa word of fact pleading state. And just this idea that if you're going to be, if you're going to ultimately draft a complaint, you want to have factual allegations that go to each of the elements of the cause of action, which is listed at the end of this memo. Um, but that's kind of the takeaway of the pleading jurisdiction. Um, it, it lays out some of the information on the jurisdiction of the courts, like when does the Superior Court have jurisdiction? When does the District Court have jurisdiction? Um, and some of the amounts there. It's got a little bit of information on the long arm statute. We've got some information on venue. Um, the fact that damages um, should, that Kentucky law prohibits stating the amount of damages in the complaint, including punitive damages. It's got rules on signing and captioning, which will become important once you draft a complaint. Um, and then, of course, the elements of a premises liability cause of action which I have edited just a little bit to make it a little bit more clear, um, because I think the way uh, the first paragraph is written kind of leaves it open as to whether or not um, a business owner would owe a duty of care to somebody like an independent contractor. I thought that was confusing. And we'll talk about it at the end of class. I can clarify that that is, in fact, the case. But in any event, since we're not, for this exercise, we weren't supposed to draft a complaint. We are just supposed to answer these questions. I thought we could just go through some of them and see what you all thought. Because ultimately, this is a very realistic scenario. I mean, it's not the most realistic. I mean, your practice is going to certainly look a lot different than this. But you want to start to think about you know, gathering facts, being presented with a kind of a fact pattern, and thinking, what are some of the questions I'm going to want to think about in preparing to draft a complaint? And these, I think, are some of the questions. So let's look at this assignment B. And I'm just going to take volunteers. And so that when nobody volunteers, I'll call on people, which will probably be the first question. Mm -hmm. Let's look at assignment A. Excuse me. Um, what about this? Assignment A says cause of action. After reading the memo, the facts about the answer the following question. One, do you think you have sufficient facts to establish a cause of action in Kentucky? What do you think? Come on. Come on. Come on. Yeah, I'm just going to joke. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. What? Yes, what? Um, because basically, in order to have a cause of action, you just need to make an injury or something like harm and money owed. I mean, that's not under the four um, things are laid out. That's kind of a broad way to look at it. But I think that there is enough, there's enough facts for us to just say, this happens, this happens, it hurts, they overdo. And there's, there's not money. In thinking about whether you have sufficient facts to establish a cause of action in Kentucky, what two things are you looking at? The one, I'll give away the one. The one is the fact pattern, mm -hmm. right? You're looking at that, and then what are you comparing that to? The elements of cause of action? Yeah, and where are those? Uh, in the world. Well, I'm in the world. No, no, that's not, I, I, most of the time they're not going to be smooth fetchy, right? You're going to have to go out there and do legal research. For our purposes, though, it was at the end of the memo, right? But you've got to figure out, like, hey, what is the landscape here? What causes of action could this person potentially assert? Um, you've got to, I mean, it's true that in reality, you're going to have to do Westlaw research or Lexis or whatever it is, figure out, you know, employment discrimination. Okay, what do you have to do to prove up employment discrimination? Like, is it a deliberate indifference to medical needs claim? Okay, this is a one, I guess, but I can't get rid of it still often. Um, you know, for some amendment claim, whatever the claim is, you've got to figure out what are the elements of the cause of action, and do I have enough facts to meet each of those elements? So, tell me again, April. I mean, April, okay. What, let's look through each of the elements of the okay. Walk through it. What facts do you have in the fact pattern? What facts tell you that there's a duty of care here? Oh. Well, that's, I got to really Well, that's fair. That's kind of where I got to yeah. too. And why? Because she's not really an invitee. Yeah, I think that is, uh, that is kind of a defect with the, the problem. And I fixed that. I'll talk about that at the end. But yeah, I, I mean. I just assume for the purposes of answering it, that you wanted to, to act like she was. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, it's true that if you look at this law and you see that a person who owns or is in control of premises or in possession of premises has a duty to use reasonable care to make a premises safe for a business invitee, the question then becomes who is a business invitee? And the law here defines it as a person whom a commercial entity invites onto its premises in the hope of being that person's patronage. And when I read that, I think of customers, not independent contractors who you hire to do cleaning. So I changed that in the complaint. But assuming that that is met, yeah, Jeff, yeah, please. I think for me, the reason why it's difficult is I'm like her, but like, are we probably supposed to go along with every year? Yeah. For me, it's complicated because, like,
the sequencing was off. There was no real introduction of like, the sequencing or the like, the real the rest of that. Yeah, now that's fair. I do think, though, I think when you're presenting with a fact pattern, it's very common that you may not be given facts that line up with, like, oh, here's the nature of relationship between parties, here's who they are. You know, not everything is like, once upon a time, there was, I don't, now I sound like I'm an asshole in Clinton, which I don't mean to be. Um, but I think that's a skill, which is taking a jumbled set of facts and figuring out what in this page or, you know, multiple pages of facts goes to the element of duty, what goes to breach. And it might be mixed up. So I think that is um, a fair skill that you're going to have to kind of learn how to tease out a little bit. But I do think you're right that the nature of whether or not there was a duty of care owed isn't really clear uh, based on this law. So I think both of your points are well taken. Um, but assuming that there, assuming that Porsche Pond is a business invitee, um, then we would assume that the duty of care is owed, right? Because you've got uh, an owner of property, an owner of a business, you've got someone performing services to the business owner as a, as a cleaner, you know, a janitor. And that's under the laws, we're assuming that that's a business invitee. Therefore, a duty of care would be owed, right? What about breach? What do you need? What sort of facts go to the element of breach? Well, you need first, April, I mean, the existence of a latent hazardous condition. You gotta first kind of tease that out, right? Because there's a lot there. You need the existence of a latent or hazardous condition that the defendant either knew of or had sufficient time to become aware of. So the first thing you're gonna want to do is break down, was there a hazardous condition at all? Yeah. And what was that? The spill. The spill, right? Yeah. The fact that this cleaning solution had spilled on the floor. And that clearly is a hazardous condition. I mean, I think you have enough there that you can at least allege there is. Mm -hmm. Then you need the defendant either knew of or had sufficient time to become aware of it. I tried to clean up some of these facts, but what do you think about this, just based on the fact pattern is given? Because she had told the manager. Yeah, she told a manager who we would think just, you know, in a kind of a brainstorming exercise, that person is someone who presumably is in contact with um, the owner, right? And is someone that, you know, he's kind of on duty to be aware that, you know, if the manager knows, it's kind of imputed to him. Something like that, you're just thinking out loud. Um, so you've got a hazardous condition, he either knew of it or at least had a sufficient time to become aware of it, right? Um, so I think that you've got some facts there. Who else went down this? What about this? And the defendant failed to remove, repair, or otherwise correct the condition. Yeah, I mean, Mitchell. Mitchell. I mean, I think about the fact that you know, the manager. <coughs> is in a position where either A, he or she can fix it with B and yeah. tell the owner, or yeah. get someone to fix it, and the fact that there's been multiple instances of seeing it and reporting it, and the fact that she once again slipped on what was there, that, yeah. that, that fact alone. Yeah, helps. those facts all go to this idea that he failed, the owner failed to remove or repair correct condition. Or, right, so you got those facts. What about failed to make reasonable efforts to warn the plaintiff? I mean, well, uh, honestly, I think all you need to do is just put like a slippery, you know, wet floor sign right over on that side of the, or that area. Yeah. And she's warned. Yeah, well, totally. And what's interesting about these facts is they're not in there, but I think almost the lack of facts is beneficial to you. There's no indication from these facts, as people are your answer, uh, it was an excellent answer. Um, there's no indication from these facts that people made a reasonable effort to warn her or anyone of the um, hazardous condition. So I think you've got some facts there. What about breach? Causing the plaintiff's harm. I clean that up too. I mean, really, causation includes both but for approximate cause. But if you're just thinking about causation generally, did this alleged breach cause her harm? I'd say so. I mean, if you went over the floor, the floor, the floor being wet or the floor. Yeah. Causing her fall, she would not have broken her hip and broken exactly. her leg. Yeah, I mean, she would never have been injured if it wasn't for this spill, right? And certainly it was within, it was foreseeable that something like this would happen. The zone of the whatever test that exists within proximate cause nowadays. But yeah, it's certainly foreseeable that someone would be injured when you repeatedly leave on um, the floor in such a slippery condition. And as a result of the breach, she suffered damages. And those are kind of clearly spelled out in the fact pattern. Doesn't mean it's a perfect case. Doesn't mean there aren't defenses that are available. Doesn't mean that a defendant might not be able to admit or deny certain allegations. What did he know? When did he know? Did he talk to the manager? How present of an owner is he? But we're thinking about just drafting a complaint. And the point of this isn't, you're probably thinking to some level, you know, it's not really that hard, right? I mean, you got enough here. But the point of this is really to kind of think not so much about how do I kind of discover elements of a premises liability complaint or, you know, how do I dig around and find facts? It's really to kind of recognize that in drafting a complaint, it's a technical way of writing in the sense that you really want to focus on ultimate facts. Gather some of these ultimate facts and then write it in a way that's neutral and that is broken up um, so that you can glean information from the defendant. And we're going to talk about that as we actually think about drafting the complaint. Um, but I think, April, you're right, I think Mitchell, you're right as well, that you probably do have enough facts here to establish a cause of action in Kentucky for premises liability. Um, what about number two? Which court would have subject matter jurisdiction of the action? Why? What the hell is that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, assume that the damages are over. Say that was not necessarily the memo, but I was that you had surgery. Mm -hmm. you know, kind of assume it's not subject to I think that's fair. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like we're at a debate here. We're like, how much of the hospital care is not called? I mean, I think that's right. And yeah, there's a lot going on here, actually. I cleaned that up to, too to make it even more obvious. But yeah, I, mean, I think multiple surgeries, broken hip, broken arm, you know, all, what else did it say? It said, um, you know, she may never walk again, or maybe may have to use a cane for the rest of her life. I mean, yeah, 20,000 is a pretty low amount. I can think you would almost certainly um, be over that jurisdictional amount. But if you can't plead the specific amount, how would you allege it? Any ideas? I, I like to get, like, when we go to work, we don't, we can't plead the jurisdictional amount. We don't have to get the jurisdictional amount. We don't have to get the yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or you could. I think the safest thing to do would be to say something like it exceeds twenty thousand dollars, right? Just so it makes it clear that you're over whatever the threshold is to get into what court, the superior court, not the district court. Um, what about venue? Any reaction to that? Could he actually be filed in Caledonia County? Why or why not? Yeah, that's when a cause of action occurred. Sure, of course it could. Yeah. What about number three? How many potential defendants do you have, and what was the basis of each potential defendant's duty? Not really a trick question. Yeah. Where you put that? How many defendants? You can think about the manager. The problem is, though, you've got to think about whether the manager owes the plaintiff the duty of care. Right. Mm -hmm. He would be someone that the owner could possibly bring in as a third party defendant if he wants to really do that. Mm -hmm. The person who would make sure would be the owner because he would have a duty to take care of the shop and make sure everything goes in Kentucky. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear. I've even tried to clean that up too to just streamline it as much as possible. Really, you just want to be focused right now for our purposes on the one defendant and that's the owner. And of course, the breach um, is the failure to either you know um, warn of the hazardous condition or fail to remove, repair, or otherwise correct it. One of the ultimate facts we've already talked about that. What weaknesses do you think exist in the case? Yeah. We already talked about the biggest one is that they still don't technically
that was just what the white gentleman made where you're making. Well, let's tease that out now. Okay, let's say that you're white, you're representing the defendant, and you find a case law that says that independent contractors come in your business. Those are not individuals uh, to whom you owe a duty of care. What are you going to do if you're a defendant and you get a complaint that makes some of the allegations along the lines of what Abel talked about or Anna? I probably uh, file the dismiss um, for lack of a uh, claim upon which it would be based. Yeah, they're going to claim, right? Because even if it's true that all of those allegations exist, right? I mean, even if all those allegations are true, um, the plaintiff hasn't stated a valid claim because of duty, right? The element of duty is not that. You need duty breach, causation, and damages. So that would be a 12 and 6 motion, which is something we're going to talk about after we get to answers, right? And thinking about civil litigation, right? We're trying to not lose sight of the big picture here, which is you kick off civil litigation by filing a complaint. The response of pleadings typically are it's an answer, but you can also get a motion to dismiss. A motion to dismiss for lack of subject matter jurisdiction, 12 1. A motion to dismiss for lack of uh, personal jurisdiction or improper venue, or 12 6. A motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim upon which it may be granted. Even if all of these allegations are true, the plaintiff hasn't stated a claim, here's why. Um, what other potential weaknesses exist beyond just maybe legal issues? Yeah, what do you think? Um, yeah, um, the question taking the three times three can all these uh, uh -huh. So I think it might not later on. Well, what, I, you're 100% right. And what would you, how would you care for it? I mean, you put your kind of torts hat on, and you're thinking about defenses and a negligence cause of action. What would you call that arguably? I think I'm making it not your reason, but like, she, she would like, well, it's interesting. No, no, that's okay. I think what you're thinking of is how does it undermine the cause of action, right? Because when you're thinking about litigation, you're thinking about what facts go to the elements of the cause of action, and do we have enough to kind of get past the 12B6 motion? But a defense would kind of be like, hey, even if all these things are true, the reason why she doesn't recover is something else. Yeah. It could maybe be a little bit of an assumption of the risk, depending on kind of some of the theoretical things. You might also think about maybe contributory negligence or comparative fault. Like, to what extent is she at fault for it? Assumption of the risk is probably a better fit for it, right? Because you knowingly kind of assumed the risk when you entered into a room that has repeatedly had a hazardous condition. But maybe there's some sort of to some extent she was negligent. You also wonder if these facts are outside the scope of the property. You also wonder the extent which sometimes she's responsible. For the condition. I mean, if she's responsible for making sure that it's cleaned, like it's a little bit of the chicken before the egg. So, it, not even necessarily is a perfect fit, but you might start to think about, hey, what are some ways that we could, as a defendant, um, undercut the plaintiff's claim, not so much by attacking the elements of the cause of action, but also thinking about affirmative defenses that could exist. Yeah. Can I just jump to how the plaintiff would be kind of like, you don't have to acknowledge that people demand three times every day? Like, how do you get out without being like, I really can't let myself three times every day? Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. I think you have to, when, there's nothing wrong with thinking about in the back of your head, as I plead this, what are they going to come back with, right? I mean, I definitely think you might have that in your mind. But that's also why you can, you're benefited just by pleading it in a neutral way. Like, uh, to some extent, when they come back, if they're going to come back with an emotion, then you're going to get into a little bit of a legal argument. Um, and so I think when you're thinking about drafting a complaint, you're really kind of most focused on the ultimate facts, proving up each of the allegations of the cause of action, and hoping that that survives the 12 6 motion. And if you can do that, defenses are something that they're going to kind of have to affirmatively plead. So you want to have it in the back of your mind, like, am I pleading this in a way that opens me up to them having a viable defense? But on the other hand, you're also just kind of recognizing that if they are going to plead a defense, they bear the burden on that. So I wouldn't be too concerned with you pointing out a latent condition as necessarily meaning that they're going to have an open and shut affirmative defense. Um, and certainly for our purposes, what you want to be thinking of is what are the elements of the cause of action, and in a very kind of neutral way, what, how can I allege ultimate facts that go to each of these elements? And it may seem very kind of elementary, but in a way, that's what you want. You want to simplify it and match up facts with elements, okay? All right, what about, number, what about uh, assignment B? Let's take a look at that. This amazing complaint that exists in. You find a premises liability complaint in your firm's files set up below. Review the list of elements set out in the memo, review chapter one and review chapter two, which are the two previous times you've already done, and then answer the question. Does the complaint that's attached contain a proper caption and jurisdictional statement? What do you think? Caption? In Kentucky. <laughs> what do you think? No, Kirby, why not? What am I looking for? Yeah, exactly. Not in Kentucky. That's insane. That's an insane caption, right? You would want something like in the Superior Court, Caledonia County, Kentucky. United States District Court for the Western District of Kentucky, right? Federal Court, Western District. Not in Kentucky. No, it doesn't have a proper caption. What about the jurisdictional statement? Where is the jurisdiction? Well, let's, let's just dissect this a little bit. This thing sucks, right? It's terrible, right? This is also different than last semester. I, FYI, like, we used the Porsche Pong thing last semester, but I edited it. Similarly, I used this thing last semester, but this one's different, too. Um, this is way worse than what we looked at last semester. This is awful, right? What else is wrong? Just looking at the caption, right? In Kentucky's wrong. Do you want to say something like, in the Superior Court? Do you want to say something like, in the Superior Court? And of course, that if it's the Superior Court, if you're in the District Court, you would say that, yeah, April. I think it's weird that the plaintiff versus blue, right? It's just the plaintiff's name has to be there. I, at first, I was going to be plaintiff versus blue, you're going to be plaintiff on the other, but that's just weird. It needs to be name versus name. Yeah, exactly. You should have something like, now this one's different, defendants, plaintiff and defendant, but something like Porsche Pond, comma, doing business as Old Town Cleaning Services, comma, plaintiff, right? Versus Philip A. Grantham, comma, doing business as Grantham Jewelry, comma, defendant. Or here it would be plaintiff Susan Braintree versus defendant Blue Lake Club. And why don't you do like name, comma, plaintiff, or plaintiff Colin Schuler versus defendant University of Kentucky? Or unpaid sales um, from hanging with nickel to hate over the summer. No, it's a joke. Um, but you know, why don't you do plaintiff versus defendant and then put the name after that? I don't have that strong of a preference. That tends to be kind of local rule. I kind of like the idea of saying like plaintiff, uh, I need markers here. Plaintiff us versus the mobile for not having markers. Um, I like the idea of like plaintiff Patty Smith versus you know defendant John Doe. The key is making it consistent. If instead you do like when I write things in court, it's plaintiff or Patty Smith plaintiff versus John Doe. I mean, we can get super technical to none of this. I don't, I mean, that's, that's the point of this. The, the real point of this question, honestly, I mean, 
I don't like this stuff as much. I like the later stuff, the memos, the judicial opinions, the, I mean, this is good, this is what we need, but I'm not like, well, I'm not gonna be a stickler on like, oh, you had this, and the six uh, parenthetical, the seven. you want it to look right, like you definitely want the right caption, whether you plaintiff first or defendant first, or it comes after, the key is that it's consistent, right? You need a name, you need the word plaintiff to be here, but it's gotta be consistent, there's not one right way to do it, there's a wrong way to do it, there are multiple right ways to do it, and there are, there are a lot of wrong ways to do it. Does that make sense? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, this is totally wrong for the reasons April suggested. Like, plaintiff is just plaintiff food, versus, and then the word defendant's not below, it just says Blue Club. So you would want to make it consistent. Either plaintiff Susan Braintree versus defendant Blue Lake Club, or Susan Braintree, comma, plaintiff versus Blue Lake Club, comma, defendant. Something like that. The case number looks, I think, okay. Judge, you might, you might need the full name. That kind of is a jurisdictional thing. Um, you know, depends on the jurisdiction of what the local rules are. But so, yeah, the, the heading is totally wrong. This is set up wrong. Um, and then the complaint, I don't know that you would title it the complaint. You might say complaint or premises liability complaint. For ours, I would do something like complaint for damages, premises liability, or premises liability complaint. Not the complaint, just sounds stupid. Like, well, of course it is, right? Um, I'd better just say complaint. Um, what about this intro? Back to you, Kirby. What do you think about this intro? Um, it's really bizarre. It's almost like socially bizarre, more so than me, right? And now comes Susan Braintree. What? Like, what? Who talks like that, right? And now comes Susan Braintree, also known as Braintree, or here and after Braintree. No, just say Susan Braintree sues, plaintiff Susan Braintree sues defendant Blue Lake Club and alleges, colon, something like that, right? None of the AKA here and after, blah, 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 they call mountains. You don't need that, okay? What about number one, the jurisdictional amount? What's wrong with that? I don't think they don't indicate which court in particular they say this language doesn't matter to them. And I don't think it's like, they don't just read it because they're not going on it. Yeah, it's all weird. Yeah. This action is for damages, period. That matter in controversy is for damages in excess of fifteen thousand dollars. Well, first of all, isn't it twenty? Did I just have a stroke? Is it the is it the twenty thousand dollars the key thing? Yeah. So first of all, like that's wrong. Fifteen thousand. I mean, but we don't even know what court we're in. Yeah. So maybe that's fine. I mean, so what you want to say is something much more streamlined. Like this action is for damages in excess of twenty thousand dollars. That would get you there. And again, remember that the point of this citation of Kentucky law really really the Pench law. First of all, Matt, even the right abbreviation, nobody knows. Right? That's what Pench law. What the what? But more importantly, you don't even need the citation of the law, right? I mean, the complaint is supposed to be alleging ultimate facts that, if true, would meet each of the elements. Not only the cause of action, but here the jurisdictional element. So something as simple as this action is for damages in excess of twenty thousand dollars would be enough to provide a valid jurisdictional statement um, to get you into the superior court of Caledonia County. Is there a proper commencement? I think we've already kind of established that it's bizarre. No, you would want to say something like plaintiff Susan Braintree. Um, I would say something like plaintiff Susan Braintree sues defendant Blue Lake Club and alleges colon. Um, what about this? Is it properly signed? Oh. Ooh, is it properly signed? I and mean, obviously, it's not signed. But I mean, where do you think about this? From Adam Colchester, the attorney. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not even technical for those things. I mean, when I, when I say I'm not going to get stickler for certain things, if it's not contemplated by the rules, and there's a little bit of flexibility what you put first, what you put second, that's fine. But if the local rules say you've got to put all these things, and you don't include any of them, and you don't sign it, and you just write the attorney, from, first of all, it's just a bizarre. Right? <laughs> Love, Adam. <laughs> what is going on here? Like, oh, anyway, I'm going to say it's a chase, but well, I always pick up another law school, and then I then hyphen it, so I see what I'm Um. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. Okay, so you wouldn't write from the from Adam Colchester. You would include kind of a, a block here that lists all of the things. I mean, it wouldn't actually be a block. It would list the address, the bar number, the, the name of the attorney, all of the things that are um, contemplated by the local rule. You would want to include, for example, uh, and also of course the signature block would actually have a line where it would actually be signed. For you all, you know, I don't mind it since you know you don't have to like feel like you have to print it out and then scan it in or anything. You could just do something like this, you know, just to like let me know that you would sign it. Or some people like to be accused and then they find a different font and then they write it in. It's kind of creative. Uh, but the point is, you actually have to sign it. Um, is the jurisdictional allegation correct for the court? Well, we don't really know because we don't know which court this is in. I mean, if it's in the district court, it would be fine that it would be alleging more than 50000 but that would actually be superfluous. All you would need to be alleging is more than $5,000. So it's not clear if it's the superior court like we think it is. Um, it's not correct. It would have to be more than $20,000. Um, what about number four? Amy, what do you think about that? Does each paragraph deal with a single element? No, this is awful. This is so bad. Like, don't use this as a template, right? What's going on here? What's number two about? Yeah, three is a disaster, right? And in that location, I mean, first of all, it's also written so poorly. Look at this, on September 9, 2003, and in that location described in the previous factual allegation, I mean, you don't need that. The defendant had suffered a film of soap. All right, that was confusing. Yeah, that's confusing. Yeah, I have no idea. I agree, it's totally confusing, right? Doesn't make any sense. And it certainly doesn't li limit to one element. It has suffered a film of soap and water to be and remain upon the tile floor of the women's changing room in the area of the sidewalk where Blue Lake staff had been mopping the floor. I mean, that is one sentence. <laughs> that is stunningly bad. On information and belief, which I hate, don't, I mean, that, I just, that exists in the law a lot. On information and belief, just allege it. Like, it's uninformed. Like, what if I came and said, on information and belief, we will do an assignment next class. We'd be like, just saying, we're going to do an assignment next class. On information and belief, who talks like that? Don't become a weirdo just because you start typing things. That's my official advice. Don't become a weirdo. But you know, people turn on this, like, I've got to talk in a legalistic way when they start typing a complaint or any sort of legal document. If it doesn't sound like something you would say, here and after, you don't say that. Here to four, you don't talk like that. That's the legalistic language that we don't need. And in fact, it runs afoul of the principles of legal writing. We've already talked about it at length. Um, so, no, it, certainly each paragraph does not deal with a single jurisdictional element. And in fact, um, paragraphs like number three and number six are bearing a lot more in there. Um, than you need. Um, even things like this, on information of the defendant knew or had sufficient time to become aware of the aforesaid hazardous condition of the tile floor. 
blue lights negligence caused her slip fall and severe injury, and you literally got multiple ones of causation damages, not to mention just the legalistic language that is not, doesn't involve just all the facts that are going to deny that allegation. I mean, if a defendant gets this complaint, especially with number three, they're just going to immediately deny the allegation. But you will have got nothing out of that. You will have learned nothing from that entire thing. A denial can be beneficial under certain circumstances. If it's a discrete issue where they deny it, you're like, oh, that's contested. That's fine. But if you just dump a bunch of words in a paragraph and then they deny it, you haven't got anything out of that. Okay. Number five, is each paragraph consecutively numbered except the commencement and demand for judgment? Let's keep going around. So we got Amy. Who's next? Tell me again. Mark. Mark, what do you think about that? Is each paragraph consecutively numbered? Uh, it looks like it. I mean, they've got that going for them. <laughs> they know how to number. Right? Woo. All right. Yeah, we've got that. You know, and that, I mean, we got a joke, but that is something you are going to want because at least when you're drafting your complaint and you've got consecutively numbered paragraphs, what you're then looking for is an answer that responds to each of the numbered paragraphs. So that is a valuable thing to have. The question is, what's in the paragraph? Go to the next one. Does each sentence set up ultimate facts? We kind of answered this, but what do you think? No, no, no. No, and what's, what specifically is the problem? I mean, what is included? Like the word negligent. Which are what? Legal conclusions. Legal conclusions, right? Those sorts of words are going to lead um, the defendant to immediately deny that factual allegation. Does any sense contain evidentiary details, extraneous details, or conclusory language? Yeah, I, mean, I think most of these do, right? Um, I'm not sure why disability has a hyphen in there. Um, but yeah, hospitalization does too, interestingly. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're just, I love, I love number five. Plaintiff slip fell was really badly injured. I'm on that. He's suffering. She broke both legs. Can you believe it? Um, yeah, that's pretty shocking. Uh, okay, what about number seven? Is the language in each paragraph clear? No, I don't think so. Is it free of legal charges? No, all of these are charges. Um, do the census focus on the actor, except when strategic considerations require a different focus? What do you think about that one? What do you think? Tell me again. Tyler. Tyler? Yeah. Okay. What do you think about that one? Uh, no. No. And why? Um, I mean, it jumps around. Yeah. It jumps around. I mean, it, part of it is, if you want to try to as best as you can, I think, use the active voice uh, and focus on specifically what each person that you're alleging engaging conduct, what they did, um, you know, that sets out an ultimate fact. Um, are time and place sufficiently clear, Tyler? What do you think about that one? No. I mean, the only really great thing was did was in paragraph three. And why might that be problematic? When you're, I mean, you don't remember, you only want to kind of allege um, dates. I wouldn't say it like that. Dates don't always have to be alleged, right? I mean, if the date is critical, not that you have to have a date on every allegation, that's not necessary. Um, but why might a date be important if there's an issue about what? Uh, on the injury occurred, I mean, yeah. I just feel like there's a lot of facts going on here for one date to be listed. Well, that's true, but I mean, what if you, when might the date become an issue? Any thoughts? It's kind of a poorly worded question. Yeah, I'm just thinking that if when the defendant gets it and they see it, they don't really know about what happened, it's going to be easy for them to deny it. They're going to say, listen, they don't have sufficient information. I think that's fair, yeah, especially if you're talking about a kind of a concrete, like, slip and fall, that's possible. What's another thing, Tyler? What if I change the date on September, what is it, 3rd? Right. Uh, I'm sorry? 9, 2003. Okay, what if I saw on September 9, 1993? And what's the relevance of that? Yeah, I mean, if, you're, if it looks like there might be a statute of limitations issue, the date becomes important. At some point, you're going to want to kind of make it clear when it happened. I think, you know, it ought to be clear somewhere in your complaint when the significant events occurred. In our complaint, when everything kind of gets set in motion on November 1st, 2019, as long as you kind of make it clear towards the beginning of the complaint, somewhere that, you know, that Portia Khan went to Grantham's Jewelry to provide cleaning services on November 1st, 2019, on that date, this is what happened. And then it kind of, the rest of it flows. Then you're not going to avoid any issue, like, I don't know when this happened, I lack sufficient knowledge, or you run into a potential statute of limitations issue, which can certainly exist. Um, what about? Ten. Does each paragraph that we've already talked about that? Is the terminology in the complaint used consistently? And the answer to that is no. And that we've already kind of talked about that. I think that honestly tends to be the key um, more than anything. I think there are a lot of kind of um, there are a lot of areas of the law in legal writing just generally, whether it's drafting complaints or answers kind of tactical drafting motions to dismiss, or um, in the more in the documents that I think will be more enjoyable to use that have that provide you with a little more detail, or drafting memo, or drafting judicial opinion, or drafting um, you know some sort of a brief a form of expository type writing where you've got some more leeway. I think there is room for how you write, and I think the key for a lot of this is consistency. You know, if you're going to number things, number them the same way. If you're going to use subheadings, you know, don't have a, a Roman numeral one that's defined that has words here, and then a Roman numeral two that doesn't, right? Make sure if you're using uh, ABC, it, it lines up, it matches, the headings are proper. Um, consistency, I think, can go a long way in drafting documents, and I think the same is true um, with respect to complaints. Any questions about this? Was this at all helpful? Does it get you kind of thinking about drafting complaints? I want to look now, if you can, if the computer is dead. I want to take a minute. Um, drafting exercises and go to the new one. Let's talk about it. Let's just spend some time talking about what we're going to have to do here. So I've edited, here, who's got notes? Do you guys have it open? Are you able to open it? No? Yes. Let's look at it. The first is the drafting exercise. No, we've got to download it. It looks like I don't know how to type. Okay, you're a first-year associate at the law firm of Romford, Guilford, and Colchester in the city of Oberon, Kentucky. Please review the updated Portia Khan, updated Portia Khan fact pattern, because we've updated it, I'll talk about that. And the memo titled Practical Fact of Kentucky Rules of Civil Procedure, which has also been updated. Also, please reread the material regarding the general introduction of litigation related documents and the initial Those are the two reading assignments you've already done. Um, then draft a one-count premises liability complaint that meets the requirements of Kentucky law. Okay. Now notice the address of Romford, Guilford, and Colchester. There you can use your you know, law school address, you can make up a bar number, those sorts of things. Um, I'm kind of more frankly in terms of the kind of meat of the complaint. Um, but let's look at the case file, which includes the new, slightly updated um, fact pattern. Okay, slip and fall premises liability case, Porsche Con fact pattern. Let's look at it. Your client has been Porsche Con, an independent contractor who owns and operates a cleaning business known as Old Town Commercial Cleaning Company. Since 2015, Porsche has performed janitorial services at Grantham's Jewelry Store, which is owned and operated by Mr. Philip A. Grantham. On November 1st, 2019, Porsche went to Grantham's Jewelry Store to clean, but was badly injured. Your paralegal recently interviewed Porsche and learned the following facts. Okay. While Porsche was cleaning the jewelry store, she went into the employee break room, one of the areas Porsche had previously agreed to clean. So, you know, it was kind of interesting to me. I, I'm, getting, I'm being a little more paternalistic with this fact patt
wasn't even fully clear to me that she was supposed to claim that. Um, I think if you got that fact, right, maybe this is like you've gotten more information from your paralegal. You also, uh, another defect even with this fact pattern is, you also, hopefully, I don't know, I don't practice litigation, you all probably know that I've never liked a plaintiff's attorney. Are people drafting complaints about meeting their clients? No, I don't think so. I think you're meeting your client. I don't think you're just like, oh, I mean, they're all over this people, right? But you're not like just saying, oh, hey, paralegal, you met with this prospective client, give me the info, and I'll just draft a complaint. No, I mean, you're, you're, you're relying on this, and your own interview with the client, and the documents they gave you, and pictures they gave you, and x-rays they gave you, and medical bills they gave you, and the mom you talked to who's like, or should have been down, you know? It's all of that, right? I mean, I think so, right? I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm just kidding, but I, don't, I think it's more than just a paralegal. But anyway. We're presuming you're getting more facts here. And one of the facts I think you'd want to glean is, hey, is this an area you were kind of supposed to clean? And these facts make it clear that one of the areas Portia had previously agreed to clean. I think that's something you want to include in a complaint, right? So that's there. However, as Portia went inside the record, don't worry, she still slipped and fell in this fact pattern on the jewelry cleaning solution that was on the floor. Okay, B. Someone had left a five-gallon bucket of jewelry cleaning solution in the area of the sink. The bucket had either leaked on the floor or a spigot attached to the bucket had been left in a position that caused fluid to burn on the floor. Okay, now this is a date. On three prior occasions, Portia had cleaned up fluid from the area around the same five-gallon bucket. On each of those occasions, after Portia cleaned up the fluid, she specifically told Mr. Grantham about the fluid that had been on the floor. So he had a hard time, he's had a hard time saying he didn't know about the latent condition, right? Because the person in this fact pattern that she told us, yeah. Okay. The employee break room is under the exclusive control of Mr. Grantham and his employees. The break room is not accessible to the public, meaning customers that it's not accessible to. But of course, remember under number Roman or um, letter A, she had previously agreed with him that she was going to clean the break room. Okay. As a result of her fall, we kind of broke this down a little bit. As a result of her fall, she broke two bones in her right arm. Portia also broke her right hip. Had to have hip surgery and went to physical therapy for three months to she to walk again. That said, Portia still had trouble walking, and her doctor tells her that she may have to use a cane for the rest of her life. Gee, today she's accumulated over $125,000 in medical bills. Which you have to think about how you're going to clean that given the rules as listed in the memo, right? Are you going to say it like that, or are you going to say it somewhat differently? Um, Portia's also. And what's interesting is this goes probably again, Michael. Michael, this kind of goes to your point, which is yes, it's about damages, but it's also the jurisdictional amount, which is something you probably want to allege at the beginning of your complaint. So my point with you was it's mostly duty breach causation and damages in that order. The story's kind of told in that order, but there might be moments where this certain things have to be moved around when you're actually drafting your complaint. This fact pattern is not written in the way you would want to write a complaint. Some of these sentences you might pull word for word, but other sentences you're going to want to change to track language that's listed in the statute, right? To kind of, but not totally, because you're alleging ultimate facts, not legal conclusions, right? So we'll kind of piece that together in a minute. Um, today, she's accumulated over $125,000 in medical bills. H, for she's also unable to carry out her cleaning business and has lost the profits and benefits that she otherwise would have received. I, great jewelry stores located in Keyhole, Penn Street, in the city of Old Town, which is located in Caledonia County, in the state of Kentucky. Oh, um, make, might make sense for vending purposes, I'll be more with the memos, and what about you do on Mr. Grant has been to the Old Town since all times. Any questions about that? So you see, it's kind of lengthened. Some of it's broken up. Some of it's cleaned up to kind of make it a little bit clearer what um, is going on. And then let's look at this memo um, on the practical effect of Kentucky rules. Singles on cleaning and jurisdiction and venue and damages. Signing is the same. Let's look at this. Though. A little update here with the elements. In Kentucky, a person who owns and operates premises has a duty to use reasonable care to make those premises safe for a business invitee. Under Kentucky law, if a business owner arranges for a person to provide cleaning services, that person is considered a business invitee. Okay, so I mean, couldn't be any more like, oh, we're not competing. Hmm. So what happens when you have two kids? You're like, well, it's going to be everybody. But yeah, and, that's, and frankly, what you would do is, in, in the real world, if you got the last bucket of premises liability action law, you know, the body of law that's given to you or that you discovered, you would then in reality you would grapple with, hey, is it business invitee? Is she a business invitee? Is she a duty of care? And then you would do a bunch of research. But the point of this class is it's not legal research, right? The point is to go out there and you glean under the law whether or not, um, you know, individuals who provide janitorial services to businesses are owed a duty of care under a big jurisdiction's premises liability law. The point is to be able to take law that you are kind of well aware of, that you can kind of understand, and use that to then draft a legally sufficient complaint. Okay, so the following is an outline of the elements of premises liability action. This is also updated a little bit. The existence of a duty of reasonable care arising from the defendant's possession or control of the premises. That's the same. And then look at this kind of work out. Breach of duty consisting of both A, existence of the hazardous condition that the defendant either knew of or had sufficient time to become aware of. Now, it's broken up a little bit to kind of make it clear to you, hey, when you're alleging facts, I think it would be wise to allege facts that first go to the existence of a hazardous condition. So you can see if they admit or deny those, right? Like, was there a leaking fluid on the floor, or was there not? Then you could separately allege whether the defendant knew of or had sufficient time to become aware of it. But you want to break it up like that. You want to break up kind of statutory or, or um, element-driven language into those chunks so that you can, in separate numbered paragraphs, allege very discrete ultimate facts that go to not just the, all of the elements, but within each element, you might have different allegations that you have to put forth. Does that make sense? Because I think a lot of times what I see, what I've seen before, both from students and practitioners, is they think I need to allege ultimate facts that go to each of the elements of the cause of action, which is true. The problem, though, is when one element of a cause of action kind of has multiple subparts. Like, if one element is breach, but breach requires you to show both the existence of a hazardous condition that the defendant knew of or had sufficient time to become aware of, and the defendant failed to remove, repair, or correct the condition, or failed to make reasonable efforts to warn the plaintiff, breach itself might be at least five number of factual allegations. You see that? But what happens is students think, well, it's all breach, I'll just pile it all into one. And the problem with that is, the more you include in a numbered paragraph, the more likely it is that the defendant's gonna find something that he or she objects to, and then denies the allegation. Does that make sense? Okay. C, or I'm sorry, three, the breach caused personal injury to the plaintiff, and four, is as a result of the breach of plaintiff's suffered damages. Okay, so what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna do Yes, drafting exercise, which is drafting one-time premises liability complaint. So how are you going to start? Well, don't focus so, I mean, you've got to have some of that. But you really kind of need to do a new analysis. You need to get out this new fact pattern, this one. And what you're going to want to do is I would, if I were you, basically set down three documents. This new fact pattern, you need to have that there. And you need to have this here,
And in doing that, we're going to have next to it are the elements of the premises liability action. And you're going to want to try to make sure that you pull facts from this fact pattern that go to each of these elements. And you want to try to build a complaint that includes allegations that go to each of those. And so, and in doing that, you also want to be mindful of any local rules and, and some of the rules of civil procedure that exist, right? So let's think, how are we going to start this? I mean, what kind of deal are we going to do? We can just, I mean, it's all good things at the beginning, right? Like the complaint, this is like a big effort to draft a complaint. So in thinking about that, how are you going to start your complaint? We'll get a head start on your assignment. What are you going to do? What's the first thing? I mean, you're going to do that work, but I mean, just think to yourself, well, how's your complaint going to start? What's it going to begin with? A caption, like this, in the Superior Court, Caledonia County, Kentucky, right? Something like this. Now, you'll probably have, well, we already know, it's going to be something like Porsche Pond doing business as Old Town Cleaning Services, Old Town Commercial Cleaning Company, plaintiff. So Porsche Pond doing business as Old Town Commercial Cleaning Company, comma, plaintiff. Or plaintiff Porsche Pond doing business as Old Town Commercial Cleaning Company, whatever you say there, versus Philip A. Grantham, comma, doing business as Grantham's Jewelry, defend, comma, defendant, right? You would put just case number here, one, two, three, ABC, whatever, ABC, one, two, three. And then you would probably draw a big line, right? And then how are you going to title it? This is really fun. It'll get more fun. If you think this is more, you classic better. This is just like we have a draft complaint. you got to be thinking about civil litigation. How do you title it? Premises. Yeah, premises liability complaint or complaint for damages, premises liability. Maybe a premises liability complaint. I think that's fine. What's next? OK, what's another word for that? Commencement. Yeah, the commencement. Yeah, the introduction. What is that going to sound like? Mitchell, right? Yeah. Uh, plaintiff, Porsche Pond, um, to Sue's defendant. Sue's defendant, Philip Ray. I mean, that's not like an ask, but the point is the consistency, yeah. right? That's the key. If you use plaintiff at the beginning there, use the defendant. If you didn't, then I think it's defendant. You could do Porsche Pond, Sue's, Philip Ray. Yeah, Sue's for. Uh, you can just say Sue's and alleges. You can say alleges, plaintiff, yeah. yeah, plaintiff, Porsche Pond, Sue's defendant, Philip Ray, and alleges. Oh, and then start. And now you're going to start numbering. What's your first one? I'm going to have to work the work. What are you going to start with? Yeah, subject matter jurisdiction allegations, right? Now remember what was defective about the last one we read. It was a disaster. And all you needed is what? This goes to Michael's point. What are you going to put? How are you going to allege subject matter jurisdiction? Are you going to say this action is for damages of totaling $125,000? Why not? Because you can't do that. You can't do that. Why not? Because the law in this. Yeah. Case. The rules prohibit that. So what will you allege? Uh, what she said earlier. Uh -huh. What did she say exceeds, earlier? Exceeds um, the threshold or exceeds $20,000. Yeah. This action is for damages in excess of $20,000. Yeah. Good. Subject matter. That's it. Then maybe it's where it gets more difficult. You want to start out by alleging facts, allegations establishing the existence of a duty. And this is where you're really going to have to start to sift through some of these allegations. And what you're, the, the long and short of it is, you're going to want to kind of make it clear, hey, here's who the defendant is, right? Here's the business that they own, and here, where they own, and where it's located. Here's who the plaintiff is. To, to demonstrate, next, after that, the nature of the relationship between the parties. So, you know, you're going to want a factual allegation about who the defendant is, one or more. You're going to want a factual allegation about who the plaintiff is. And you're going to want a factual allegation about the fact that the plaintiff went to the defendant's store to provide cleaning services on such and such a day. Or on such and such a day, the plaintiff went to the defendant's store to provide cleaning services. Okay? Those all go to duty, right? So you're taking your duty law, and you're putting numbered factual allegations that go to that element. Notice nowhere in there are you saying, and thus, the defendant of the plaintiff duty of care. Now I say that. Could you say that, though? I think you maybe could do that. You could do that. But the point is, that's not what the purpose of the complaint is. See, before this class, maybe you do this. And again, this is like the least sexy part of the class, right? Like, this isn't the most fun part. But you may have come in here thinking, like, oh, we're going to, like, in a complaint, have to prove duty and prove breach. And it's true you do, but you do it through factual allegations. You don't do it through, oh, I'm going to argue to you that there's a duty. I'm going to argue that there's a breach, right? It's not like, it's not like torts class where, hey, because this could be, you can imagine this being like 1L torts. Here's your negligence fact pattern. Tell me whether Portia Pond has a viable cause of action for premises liability. Can she prove up a negligence claim? And it would be all about, like, the first issue was duty. Under the law in Kentucky, a person who owns property, you know, has a duty to use reasonable care, blah, 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 under Kentucky law. And then you have applied to these facts, blah, 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 blah. In conclusion, she, Grantham owes her a duty of care. That's how you would analyze a set of facts and come to a conclusion about whether or not each of the elements are met. What's interesting is, for purposes of a complaint, you're just writing the factual allegations in a very neutral way with the law to the side, but that's not really creeping into the complaint. Do you see that? I know that sounds like easy, and you would be stunned how many lawyers' complaints are, first of all, look like this awful one, but more importantly, are just riddled with statements of law, right? But that's not what the purpose of a complaint is, right? In a way, it's almost fair to like, assume that the reader, the defendant, but also the court to some extent, you also, in America, assuming that they just know the law, right? That they're kind of going to be able to read this and kind of acknowledge that these are the elements that are going to go to duty. These are the elements, oh, okay, duty, breach, without those words being in there. Now, all of that said, that's not to say you couldn't include the words duty or breach or causation or damages in your complaint. Where might you include them? There's kind of two ways I can think of it. Still, despite what I just said, you may be still including them. Is, that, is, this, is this making any sense? Some of you look like disturbed. It's just me. What, do, do you know what I'm saying? Does this make sense? Yeah, I think that's one way you could do it, right? You could say something like, you could do it at the beginning or the next one. You could say, um, the defendant, you would actually write the word defendant, nobody's right at all. You would say the defendant, or Philip Grantham, owed the plaintiff a duty of care. Number one. Number two. So the defendant owed the plaintiff a duty of care. Now this, this runs afoul of the rule of number one, right? This is like a legal conclusion. This is like Michael, right? Michael? 
Yeah, Mark. Mark, so no, no. <laughs> Mark, the set told me, right? You need to have all different facts. You don't have legal conclusions. This is a legal conclusion. I'm now telling you, maybe you could include that in your complaint. But you would, one way you could do it, as Engel suggests, is as a segue into the ultimate facts, right? You would then want something like, well, the defendant owned a, owned a grocery store named Grantham's Jewelry, or not grocery store, whatever, you know, jewelry store named Grantham's Jewelry store, located at this. And that would be the ultimate fact. And then you would say the plaintiff um, ran a cleaning company known as this. Fourth, on this day, she went to provide the very discrete ultimate facts that would easily be admitted or denied. And so then the question is, well, what the hell function is this, sir? Why have this? Well, it kind of, it's like a roadmap. Do you see that? Right? It kind of just orients you, the plaintiff, the attorney, or maybe the reader, the defendant even. Like, you know, you're providing a little bit of a service to them. Like, hey, this is the duty stuff. Or the court, like, you know, oh, okay, you're alleging duty here. And this is why, and this is why, this, oh, these go to the element of duty. That's one way you could do it, right? Another way you could do it is to not put this in here and maybe do A, you gotta be real careful. I don't know about that. One, two, three, because then the question is if you do a B, is it then four? I think you've got to stay sequential, right? What I kind of like a little better is, is something like this, just a word. Because then it's really not, I don't know if that's technically allowed, but it's there, like duty. Now I'm going to allege things that go to duty. Why do you do it? Why am I doing it? Because you're new at this, and you need the comfort, right? You need the like blanket of, I want to make sure I have enough factual allegations to go to each of the elements. Maybe what you do is that, you do it all, right? Maybe down here you've done, then you have breach. Maybe you do it like this, where you literally put brackets around it. And then maybe you get to the very end, and you finish it all, and then you delete them. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm trying to be kind of funny in a way, but it, what I'm trying to tell you is, there's no, like what, I mean, this is like full disclosure now. The teacher's manual puts them in brackets. Like subject matter jurisdictions, duty, breach, causation. I, I think it could make its way into the complaint. The point is, it's not doing any of the work for you. That's not helping you win your case. But they're gonna, to the extent you actually plead that, they're gonna probably deny most of those allegations because like the book tells us, they're legal conclusions. But but it's like it's like um, headings or uh, Roman numerals, or I like some of that stuff because I think it orients me when I'm drafting something. I like the fact that I hit all of my bases, right? It goes back to that idea that I talked about earlier in one of the last few classes about, you know, when you take an exam, you jot down your outline real quick. It, it makes sure that you don't leave something off. And while that may not sound significant, it can be very significant because if you don't include allegations that go to all of the elements, what's gonna come back, Mitchell? If you don't include it, no, no, okay, you're saying, hey, so that's why it can be very helpful to you to be like, oh, duty, breach, causation. I don't worry that for our purposes you're going to forget that, but it's just a light tip, which is you can include legal conclusions in your um, complaint, but you need to recognize that they're not actually doing work for you other than orienting you and another reader. So now I've beaten a dead horse, um, but I think I get the point. Any questions about that? It's up to you. I would maybe include them. Just like duty, breach, causation, damages. I think it's helpful. If you don't want to, that's okay, that's fine too. Um, what's interesting is, in the manual, not only do they put like things like subject matter jurisdiction, just for the purposes of orienting them, right? The professors Temple Smith and Couples, they also, within elements, like breach, they even put some of the subheadings, like existence of the hazard. I mean, these are two law professors who are a lot smarter than me, right? And have much more experience drafting civil documents. They feel the kind of security blanket of legal words, right? So I think it's fine if you include that too. But notice it keep, they keep their factual allegations kind of consistent, right? I also think some of this is poorly drafted. Notice I've like started scratching it out. But anyway, who the hell? I mean, it's all good fake. No, it's not like one person, Amy's gonna get it, and you all can't. Like, Amy's complaint might be excellent, and it could look very different than Mitchell's, and that's okay, right? I mean, Amy's probably the better. <laughs> but, you know, what do you know? It's not a big deal. Um, but no, I mean, seriously, it's, it, they, they will look different. Everybody will have their own style. Some people will include headings, some people won't. Some people will have a slightly longer allegation, some people won't. Some people will be more reactive voice than others. Um, but take a stab at it. So that's really all I got. Um, one, the only other note, just give me two minutes. So you'll do that, right? You'll look at this um, new kind of set of factual allegations that's been updated. You'll look at the updated memo. You'll try to draft a complaint. You'll turn that in by Saturday at 5. And then you will turn your attention to the next reading assignment, which has already been posted, um, which is on answers. Um, and that is here. I mean, this stuff, the complaints and answers. I'd like to really like advanced authority class, which is basically how I turned the second class into. Um, this gives you a good sense, though, like of admissions, denials. But you'll, this will kind of be a really kind of comprehensive reading assignment on if you have a complaint, how do you properly respond to it in a defensive way? And not only will you be thinking about things like admissions and denials, but it also starts thinking about things like affirmative defenses and how you plead those. And it includes things like assumptions of risk or um, you know, some of the other things like inventory and negligence that we discussed. Um, but we'll focus on drafting an answer next time, for the next week, after we've had a chance to kind of thoroughly discuss this. So draft your complaint, turn those in good faith by Saturday at 5, and then turn your attention to the reading, which is in tomorrow. All right, guys. I hope that was not too terrible. <laughs>